So, dear Hans, I uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a big honor and pleasure to speak to you about one of my favorite subjects. I've always been interested in guns since the time of my childhood. And uh, when I was a little boy, uh, political correctness was not invented yet. And nobody knew what, it's, uh, what it meant to be woke. And therefore, we ruthlessly played cowboys and Indians, a racist game, of course, and we, and, and we used uh, toy guns, which were available at every toy store without any problems at the time. Uh, we were not accused of red-facing, and we were not accused of cultural appropriation. What a golden era. Uh, for those of you who have no idea what to do with the name of Samuel Colt, Samuel Colt was an ingenious inventor and businessman uh, which constructed a repeating arm with a cylindrical ma uh, magazine which uh, gave you the possibility to shoot six times without reloading. This was at the time a big advantage. My uh, speech will be uh, structured like follows. Uh, I give a, a small a brief overview over the history of uh, the development of armament and technology, uh, a few words about ballistics and calibers, about the legal situation on both sides of the Atlantic, the policy debate, the pros and cons of private gun ownership, and finally the ethics of gun ownership and my conclusions. From all the beginning on, uh, from by nature, humans are not very well equipped to survive in a in an uh, hostile environment with big dangerous uh, animals and uh, and uh, predators. We are neither fast nor strong compared to other predators. We are, have no strong jaws, and we have no paws with claws. So hence, there had to be done something in order to uh, to, to survive. The first weapons uh, humans uh, produced were like this. It was clubs, it was axes, and it was spears. And the oldest finds of this kind of weapons date back to 400,000 years. So they have a long history uh, behind them. The next step was the idea to extend the range of, uh, of, of uh, action, range extension. That meant the invention of bow and arrow, for instance, and for instance, uh, they, they date, back, date back to the late Paleolithic age, approximately 30,000 to 10,000 years before Christ. I have here two uh, different samples. This is an English longbow, uh, which has been used by the British archers in the uh, Hundred Years' War with uh, French. And another one is the Equestrian Arch of the Mongolians, which is quite short to be, uh, give the, the, the uh, horseman the possibility to use it from the horseback. Another possibility was the spear thrower. It's a quite tricky, a tricky thing if you have ever tried a thing like that. It extends uh, the length of your arm, and this gives you the possibility to give more, uh, uh, more velocity to the spear. But in fact, it's not easy to, to get on target with that. Uh, so it's easier to, 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 to um, have a good uh, shot with a bow and arrow. Another possibility for range, ex range extension was the crossbow. The oldest finds date back to 400 before Christ to the ancient Greece. This is not the ancient Greece one. This is a medieval uh, crossbow. And the main advantage uh, compared to bow and arrow is uh, that you do not have uh, to, to, to hold the full weight of, uh, of, 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 the, of the bow. And it gives you the possibility to get on target like with a rifle. You, it, it's not necessary to be physically strong. If you have ever uh, shot with bow and arrow, you know if it's, it's a strong bow, which, is, which is, uh, gives you the possibility to hunt with that. That means 30 to 40 kilograms you have to hold here, and that means you have to come to a shot within very, very few seconds, otherwise you couldn't hold it. This is the, the advantage of the crossbow. The disadvantage is that it takes a relatively long time to reload. Whereas uh, a good trained archer, I have shown you the picture of the arch uh, 
used by the British archers in the Hundred Years' War, they could fire up to 10 arrows per minute. And so if you have uh, uh, hundreds of these kind of archers and they do all the same, it's like uh, like uh, light artillery. It's a, it's a terrible, uh, terrible uh, effect, uh, especially on, uh, on, on non uh, with uh, so not 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 on uh, heavily equipped uh, personnel. Very soon after the uh, invention of black powder, which was at the beginning of uh, the 14th century, the first firearms appeared. Uh, the first uh, arms, arquebus, Hakenbüchse in German, uh, looked very primitive. Were very primitive. It's just an iron pipe. Uh, with a with a bore on the lateral side of the ending of the of the bore of the, of, of the of the of the pipe and a wooden shaft and the function was like that you had uh, a hemp rope which had been ignited and this glowing uh, hemp rope uh, was pressed into a pan with powder below the uh, below the uh, bore uh, on the rear side when you press the trigger. And this caused a flame which went into the, uh, into the pipe where the, uh, where, the car, where, the, where the load was ignited and the uh, ball made out of stone or even from lead uh, came out of the barrel. Uh, different types of this kind of weapon were produced and they all together were not really reliable. You could not use it when it rained and not when the wind blew very, uh, blew very heavily because uh, it would have uh, wiped away the powder on the powder pan. Next step, a big step forward was the wheel lock musket. And the function of this wheel lock musket was like uh, in, a, in, a, in a mechanical watch. You wind up a, a spring and uh, you uh, you, you press a, a piece of pirate with with this lever on the on a on a fluted wheel, and as soon as you pull the trigger, the uh, the wheel starts to rotate, producing a spark, and the spark ignites uh, powder and the pen and uh, on the pin, and uh, the function is then like in the arquebus. It was a quite complicated system. It was expensive to produce and was not easy to maintain in the battlefield. So therefore, uh, people looked for a more easy to maintain system and came up with the stone lock weapons. Uh, from the late century on, was the successors of the wheel lock musket looks like this. You have uh, a hammer in which you bring in uh, a piece of flint stone and as soon as you pull the trigger, it goes down, producing a spark uh, and uh, igniting the load which is inside the barrel. The next big step forward uh, was uh, the percussion weapon. The percussion weapon occurred uh, when uh, a material was found that explodes when being hit. There were two different types, the bright mercury or potassium chlorate, uh, which were given into a small cap like this. And these small caps were uh, put on the piston, you see here, on the piston. And when you pull the trigger, uh, the hammer falls, igniting uh, the potassium load, uh, the, sorry, the, the mercury load, and then the uh, charge inside the barrel goes up. The first rear loading rifle was also a big step forward. Uh, all the others I showed you before had to be loaded from above, from, from the front side of the muzzle, which meant, which meant that the shooter has to stand upright, fill in the black powder, put in, uh, the, uh, put in the ball and compress that load. That meant that the shooter has to stand upright and gives a good target. In military confrontations, it's, it's, it, this is obviously a disadvantage. And this first reloading rifle, it was a system Dreise, a Prussian uh, one called Zündnadelgewehr, a ignition needle rifle, patent has, given in, has been given in 1840. This uh, rifle played a decisive role in the uh, German war of 1866. The Prussian troops were equipped with this rifle, whereas the enemy, the Austrians and the Saxonians, had still a muzzle load uh, system, the Lorenzgewehr, 
the Lorenz rifle, and uh, the advantage of this rifle was they could fire four times faster than the Austrians, and the even bigger advantage wa was they had not to stand up uh, upright if they reloaded it. They could uh, lay on the ground and gave a uh, much, um, much less uh, target for the, for the enemy. It was still using paper, pa uh, paper cartridges, this has to be noted, because the Sharps rifle from 1848 was the first to use full metal uh, cartridges. It had a brass cartridge, including a, 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 a cap, a percussion cap, the, the load of black powder at the time, and, uh, and the projectile. It was a big step forward, but si si still a single loader. You had to load after each single shot again, but using metal cartridges. Uh, the first repeating rifle with a bolt action system was uh, the Mauser from 1888. This was uh, in, so, in so far a big advantage as you had five shots in the magazine, without reloading, so it gave more firepower uh, than a single loading rifle. On the other side of the, uh, of the Atlantic in the States, they went another uh, direction. They uh, produced from 1862 on so-called lever action uh, rifles, which meant you had um, a tubular magazine which is located below the barrel. It looks like a second barrel, but isn't, isn't one. And you had up to, depending on the length of the, of the cartridge, up to 14 uh, rounds within this, uh, this magazine, uh, which gave a lot of, of, of firepower. Next step, uh, the famous Winchester from 1873. Everyone who has ever seen a Western movie will be familiar with this kind of weapon. Every, every, every cowboy and every, every gunfighter has, has used this kind of weapon. Finally, they came up with the Winchester of 1895. President Theodore Roosevelt and his Rough Riders used uh, this rifle in their, uh, their different wars. And this had a magazine below the, the, uh, be below the system and gave uh, the possibility to shoot also projectiles with, tip, as well, with, 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 with tips, so which is not possible if you use a tubular magazine. The first uh, repeating handguns, and now we come to Colt, look like, looked like this. This was the Colt from 1860, uh, 60, the Colt 1860 Army. It came just one year before the outbreak of the Civil War. was still a front-loading weapon where you had to fill in the powder in the front uh, of the, of the, of the uh, drum, put in uh, the, the, the uh, ball, and put uh, the, the, the caps on the rear side, so you had six shoot, uh, you had six shot. A big step forward was then the Colt Single Action Army, the world famous Colt Peacemaker from 1873, using full metal cartridges and was a rear loader. You have a reloading uh, item on the, on the back of the drum and can load six rounds, and after that, uh, you can easily remove the, uh, the, the empty, cut, uh, empty brass um, cases and, uh, and replace, it with, uh, replace it with new ones. Uh, this is just a look to contemporary revolvers. They look like this. This is a uh, Colt uh, Model six, uh, 36 Chief Special, and this is a, sorry, a Smith and Wesson, and this is a Colt Python. The history of uh, semi-automatic pistols started with the bow cut from C, uh, uh, C93 and uh, went forward with the Mauser C96 and the numbers stand for the, for the patent. That means in, 19, in 1893 the bow cut uh, occurred and uh, in 96 the Mauser. This Mauser pistol has been used uh, from, by different officers around uh, the, the armies in the world was available in different calibers, in, in a Mauser caliber and in 9mm Parabellum. Modern semi-automatic pistols look like this. This is the Glock 17, an Austrian invention. Has a plastic, uh, plastic grip, is very, uh, very light, and that means for people of 
police officers, for instance, who have uh, to carry the weapon all the day, it's, uh, it makes a difference if it weighs 800 grams or it weighs 1.5 kilograms. This is very light and has a big magazine capacity. Another modern uh, weapon is the Sieg Sauer, a German-Swiss cooperation, for, uh, P226, uh, which has full metal uh, frame. Just for the uh, sake of completeness, because I want to concentrate on weapons used by civilians, is the Gatling gun of 1861. It came just at the day when the, uh, when the uh, civil war in the United States broke out. And this looks like a machine gun, but in fact is not one, because it has been manually operated. You see this crank, Kurbel, and this has to be turned and then the function was, uh, was uh, that the, the, the rotating bundle of, of, uh, of barrels fired up to 400 rounds per minute. The first real fully automatic gun was the Maxim from 1884, which gave a firepower of 600 rounds per minute. And there was this famous speech when this occurred and the British troops were the first and the only one to have, have it at that time. Uh, Whatever happens, we have got the Maxim gun, and they have not. And uh, this was a real big advantage over uh, less good equipped uh, people. Just a few words about uh, the energy. Uh, we have learned that the kinetic energy depends on the mass and on the velocity of the, uh, of the object. And if you take into consideration that the velocity goes in by square, it's the more important part uh, than, uh, than the mass. Also important is the compound, the shape, and uh, this ma the material which the bullet, bullet is made out of. But this is, I don't want to go too, too deep in details. I give you just an overview of a few uh, cartridges available. The 9 millimeter parabellum on the top of the list is the, I think, most uh, widespread uh, pistol caliber in the world, has a muzzle energy of approximately, uh, can, can slow below, uh, just below 500 Joule. Uh, and uh, the powerful 44 Magnum, everybody who has ever seen a film from Clint Eastwood where he played Dirty Harry or Callahan, he used a powerful uh, 44 Magnum, the model 29 from Smith & Wesson with an 838 inch barrel, really a mighty gun. It has roughly the three times the muzzle energy than the 9mm parabellum. It's really, you can, you can hunt a beer with this kind of weapon. Uh, the block below is, uh, is some um, cartridge ammunitions. The 223 Remington is now the uh, contemporary round for the NATO uh, troops. It has a relatively high velocity, but due to the uh, low weight of the, of the bullet, it has uh, a relatively low uh, muzzle energy. So if you would use it uh, for hunting, deer hunting, a deer up to, let's say, 15 or 20 kilograms would be the maximum. So it's not really, uh, I, I do not know the uh, English word for that, but it's not really good for a hunter to shoot with too, uh, too, low, too less, um, too, uh, too weak uh, ammunition. But in fact, uh, the, the, the target is not to, to, to kill uh, the, um, the enemy soldier, but to wound him, because this binds other ones to, 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 uh, who have to take care of them. I'm relatively old. I've been uh, trained with the uh, cartridge below in military with the 308 Winchester, which is ra uh, roughly double, has roughly double the impact, but uh, the cartridge is much bigger and heavier and uh, the people using the smaller, uh, smaller cartridge can carry more ammunition. Uh, on, the, on the basis, the 338 Lapua Magnum is a uh, is a, a cartridge which has been uh, uh, produced or, or is still produced for snipers. You can go with up, up to more than 1,200 meters with a caliber like that, if you are a good, good sniper. About the legal situation. Uh, it's a big difference between the States and Europe. The big difference uh, is uh, going back to the Second Amendment to the Constitution of the United States, which uh, states the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, which means a lot. But 
because uh, the weapon uh, law is uh, due to the single states, it's not the union law, but to the, due to single states, there are big differences in the different states in the uh, in, in, in USA. For instance, in Michigan or in New York State or in California, it's quite uh, quite uh, restrictive, whereas in other states, it's relatively liberal. In Europe, there is no such thing as a second amendment in no one of the European countries, and hence, altogether, uh, the situation in Europe is more restrictive than in the gun-friendly states in the USA, like Texas or Missouri. Uh, special situation in uh, Germany and in Austria. In Austria, the first step to get uh, what you can call a, a weapon law is a Kaiserliches Waffenpatent, an, er uh, an emperor's weapon decree, which has been introduced in 1852. It, in fact, regulates as good as nothing. It, it, it forbids just to have a cannon as a private person. Otherwise, you could buy whatever you wanted. Interesting to say that uh, the left forces in the 19th century, as long as they had, had no political power, they were absolutely in favor of relatively or uh, absolutely liberal uh, weapon regulations. For instance, Marx and Engels uh, claimed the armament of the proletariat with shotguns, rifles, cannons and ammunition has to be enforced immediately. And when the Austrian Social Democrats gathered together uh, to their founding convention, uh, convention in 1888, close to Vienna, they for, uh, demanded the replacement of the standing army with general people's armament. So if you, if, you re if you say this to a Social Democrat of today, he won't believe it, because uh, things have changed dramatically. So then, long time, there happened just nothing. No real, uh, restrict, uh, no real restriction occurred even after the First World War until 1933 when Adolf Hitler came into power in Germany and he uh, made the Reichsverordnung zum Schutz vom Volk und Staat, a decree for the protection of people and state. And this was uh, the, uh, the basis for disarming political opponents and, of course, of Jews. When Austria has been integrated in the German Reich in 1938, uh, it was just a matter of a of, of, of few months that this national socialist law has been also integrated in the Ostmark in uh, former Austria. After 45, this law has, with only few exceptions, uh, taken over in the legal file of uh, post-war Austria and kept its validity until 67. In 67, there uh, came up the gun law of 67, which had exactly this name, and this regulated uh, different categories of weapons and, uh, and um, de declared who with what, uh, under what conditions can buy and own and bear what kind of arms. After that, a series of, uh, of intensifications followed, often um, event-related. There was a case of a, a series of bank robberies in Austria, all perpetrated with so-called pump action uh, shotgun, and the result was that the pump gun had been forbidden. So it's absolutely not logic because you can still buy legally a half-automatic shotgun, but not, uh, but not a repeater. Uh, and um, the character of the, of, the, of the gun laws in total has become every day stricter. Today, uh, you can say that almost all opponents of private gun ownership stand politically on the left side. The more the democratization goes ahead, the more the lives of the individuals are regulated by the collective. And this is especially true for the weapon provisions. The restrictive trend of gun laws follows the democracy script of permitting all spheres of life. Uh, Hans has written a lot of this trend and uh, this is still unbroken today. The modern welfare state has brought an end to the security of private property, which is more than obvious considering the gun law. There are different types of guns where you can get a special permit, but as soon as you die, uh, you're... Uh, you're uh, 
um, higher, higher, Erbe, is it correct? Higher. High risk cannot uh, cannot uh, legally own this gun, so you have to to destroy it, or give it to, to the to the police. So that means, in fact, it's uh, it's eigentum of zeit. It's a property as long as the state says, well, it's okay. Just a few uh, examples of the main uh, arguments of the anti-private armament act activists. Weapons kill. No weapons, no violent crime. Restrictive gun laws produce security. Disarmed societies are more peaceful. Well, one cannot repeat often enough uh, but th that not weapons, but people kill. You can lay down here a fully automatic gun, uh, fully loaded, and, and leave it there for, ye for years and nothing will happen. The, the, the weapon will not kill anybody. Uh, violence is not a question of the availability of a special type of weapon because you can in fact use nearly everything as a weapon if you want to, to, to beat or kill them, uh, somebody. But it's a question of the dominant culture. If this were true, that restrictive gun laws produce security, Switzerland m would be a nightmare because as you know, Switzerland has a militia army and uh, a lot of militians have the fully automatic gun, including the, 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 uh, the, the um, cartridges at home. As far as I know, nothing happens with this kind of weapons. On the other hand, Haiti has a very restrictive gun law. You are not allowed to have anything and Haiti is really not a safe heaven. So both of these arguments are wrong. And uh, this is, this armed society is a thing that does not exist, but uh, because everybody who wants to get something will get something. We have a very strict uh, drug law in Austria. Nevertheless, uh, you will easily be able to, uh, to find somebody who sells a, a joint to you or, or something else. Violent criminals always get what they want. They use the dark net or go to the, to the black market and therefore uh, you just harm normal, ordinary, law-abiding citizens. Next argument. Only violent criminals need guns. Weapons in the households cause accidents. And when confrontated with violence, don't fight back. Instead, call the police. Well, in a liberal and pluralistic society, nobody but the individual himself has uh, the right to decide what he needs. Uh, the, the, the collective cannot say what you need. Otherwise, uh, there would also be no need for silk pyjamas, lipsticks or condominiums. Uh, it's true that a lot of accidents uh, um, happen in households, but the share of gun accidents is under the perceptual limit. And if you really uh, think that uh, the police will help you, help you in, a, in a situation of acute um, confrontation with, uh, with uh, violent crime, you will be lost because there will be no police. Uh, the only one you can depend on is yourself. And uh, a recently perpetrated massacre in an elementary school in the USA speaks plain words. Uh, Paradoxically, uh, this caused another di uh, discussion about gun laws, but in fact, the police occurred at the site and did 45 minutes just nothing and left, uh, left the perpetrator alone and he killed, as far as I remember, 14 to 16 children and, and, and some of the, of the teachers. Legal private gun ownership is a valid indicator for the relations between government and citizenry. Uh, Niccolo Machiavelli, which was far from being a libertarian, wrote uh, this, uh, this I, I will give you the quote, you will never find that the new prince has disarmed his subjects. In the contrary, when he found them unarmed, he's always armed them. By arming them, his, this weapon will become truly yours. Those who are suspect to you become true to you, and those already true to you will be strengthened. You transfer them from subject to pendants. It's very pragmatic. Uh, 
there is no more evident expression of distrust of a state and its officials against citizenry than to deny them the right to own and bear arms. The British police officer Colin Greenwood, he wrote the book Police Tactics in Armed Operation States, the following, which is close to that what I already said. Gun laws are reliable scale for the assessment of the mental and moral health of a government, their administrators and the liberal potency of a society. It's always a sign of distrust of the officials to the citizenry when they deny you this right to ear, bear arms. Basically, there are two antagonistic points of view. Anti-gun activists want to prevent any harm caused by firearms. The gun right advocates derive the demand to own firearms from the right to live and self-defense. Anti-gun activists are in favor of a total ban of private gun ownership and ignore the fact that uh, the means of actions are, action are really irrelevant. In Austria, there exists a study that 80% of all bloody deeds are perpetrated with knives. Uncons inconsequently, uh, the anti-gun advocate do not raise the demand to ban knives, at least not so far. And the gun right advocates consequently fight for a liberal gun law because they think that firearms are the most effective repellent to violent crime. There is a proverb dating back to ancient uh, Rome, ab usus non tollit usum, which means wrong use does not preclude proper use. And that means that uh, uh, misuse of arms must not be the basis for a prohibition of legitim legitimate possession and use of firearms. Otherwise, the legislation would be de facto transferred in the hands of criminals or fools, and the legislation would degenerate to unscrupulous event legislation. A US study from 2019, which is very interesting, shows that violence and criminal misuse of firearms are correlated with factors like ethnicity, Afri African Americans are massively overrepresented in statistics of violent crimes, while people with Asian roots almost do not appear there. It's interesting to note that somebody, uh, some, some uh, always uh, bring the argument of Japan, which has an extremely uh, restrictive gun law, and also a very, very low rate of, uh, of, of violent crime. And they claim that uh, this low rate of uh, violent crime depends on the restrictive, uh, restrictive gun law, which cannot be true because hundreds of thousands uh, of um, people in the United States with Japanese roots have there the possibility to, uh, to purchase uh, fire weapons and still don't use it for, uh, for, for, uh, for, for violent cri crime. Another factor is the education. The lesser, the more violent orientated. The social status, poverty and unemployment increase the willingness to use violence. Therefore, the attempt to concentrate all prevention activities of violence uh, to restrictive gun laws falls short in doing so. John Lott, I think you have invited him to here some years ago. I haven't, unfortunately, I haven't met him. He wrote a very, very good book uh, named More Guns, Less Crime, states the following. Restrictive gun laws are in favor of the perpetrator. Criminals don't seek shootouts, uh, but defenseless victims. And the rates of violent, cri fire violent crimes are higher in federal states with restrictive gun laws than in ones with liberal gun legislation, which in the first place uh, sounds a paradox, but in fact, as uh, he, he stated, that uh, the criminals don't seek a fire a firefight uh, with with his victim. He prefers to go to places where he can be sure to have no uh, no resistance, no armed resistance. So it comes to a crowding out of violent crimes, and gun-free zones are uh, like magnets for mass murders. You have never heard of a mass shooting on a gun site where everybody is, is armed uh, heavily, but you have heard a lot of, uh, of, of massacres in uh, elementary schools or in, on, on university campuses where nobody is uh, allowed to be an arm. And David Koppel, a law lawyer and gun expert, uh, write, wrote a book, The Human Right of Self-Defense. Uh, he states, the right to self-defense is unsubstantial if one does not possess the adequate 
means for that. Without guns, the right to self-defense would be reduced to martial arts professionals like Charlie, Jackie Chan or uh, uh, Bruce Lee, and this cannot be the intention of the legislator. From the right to protect his life, the right to own weapons suitable for this derives compellingly, and that means that no, no government has the right to prevent somebody from self-defense by prohibiting the right to possess the necessary means, namely guns. So uh, I have to hurry up. Uh, just a few words uh, for the possibilities to protect your home. Uh, it's in, in a lot of, of countries, it's more difficult to get a handgun than a rifle. And therefore, I recommend here three types of rifles. Uh, the, the, one is, uh, the first one is a shotgun. In this case, it's a Russian one. Uh, so he made, I, I, I made this uh, foliage be, be, before the, 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 the uh, bans on Russian products. You can also have other ones. It's a double-barreled uh, double, uh, uh, gun. And the shotgun has the, the advantage that it has a, r a lot of power on, on short distances and uh, does not cause that much danger to, 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 far, uh, far, to, to people who are not involved in the thing. Another possibility with more firepower is a, is a pump-action shotgun, which is forbidden in Austria, as I told you. And if you expect uh, violent uprisings and, uh, and uh, let's say, uh, civil war-like uh, situations, you have to have more firepower, and this is gave, given to you by semi-automatic guns like the Ruger Mini-14 or, Mini or any clone of the AR-15, which shoots the 223 three Remington round. To come to, com to my conclusion, from the beginning of civilization, people were either armed or at high risk and nothing has changed so far. An armed society always is a polite society. Gun ownership is a hallmark of the free man. Slaves are unfree, were forbidden to own weapons with only few exceptions in history. The only one who can ensure one's own safety against violent attacks wherever, from, from what side they ever may come, is the individual himself. The most effective means of defense against such assaults is a firearm. Therefore, arm yourself. I thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>